Guys, I have to tell you something. Last Sunday, it was February 2nd, 2020, and I decided that the video that I was gonna post on that date would be 20 minutes and 20 seconds long. And then YouTube decided to fuck with me and add an extra second onto that video. As a result, I have canceled YouTube. I am pissed, but you know what's not canceled? The L word generation Q, O-M-G. As you guys might know, when the L word generation Q premiered, I took myself over to Jolene's. It was packed, girl. There were like 500 lesbians all in this bar. I could not walk to and fro. I, I wanted to go to a watch party because I feel like that's just the way to experience the L word, but I was not able to experience the L word comfortably at Jolene's. But then later I discovered something that really pissed me off because the whole time I was there at Jolene's, I was like, what the fuck is going on? We live in San Francisco. San Francisco has a reputation for being super duper duper gay. And there's so many people here, it could fill up a fucking movie theater. They should just rented out a movie theater, then we could have paid some, and then we could have watched it at a movie theater. I later learned that there was a screening at the Castro Theater. It just wasn't fucking advertised anywhere. I spent months Google searching our viewing party, San Francisco, trying to find out what the fuck is going on. I found out about all of these other viewing parties happening in LA and New York City. They got to watch The L Word in an auditorium or in a movie theater and I was like, why couldn't we? We're just as gay as them. And then this whole time, they did that, but then didn't tell me. You know, I was in the Castro days before this happened. I didn't see this advertised anywhere. I didn't see it advertised online, but also like when I went on Muni and I went to the Castro station, there were fucking posters of the L word, you know, like saying, hey, we're back again. But nowhere did it say, oh, we're back again. And you can watch the L word at the Castro theater. I think Eileen Shaken was there and also the creator of a work in progress because it was a screening of the L word and a work in progress. And by the way, a work in progress was also renewed. So this whole time I was like, I was angry that I was shortchanged in that way, that I did not find out about this after the fact. And I was like, oh no, this is not happening to me again. Next season, I am gonna be the first one in line at the Castro Theater. I'm not leaving any stone unturned. I am going to that fucking event. And then I I keep looking at, oh, what are the ratings for the last episode? I'm like, oh, that doesn't look great. It's good enough to get us a second season and we're not just getting eight episodes like we got for season one. We're gonna get 10 episodes, which is fucking fantastic. Um, but I have a confession to make. I actually, <laughs> I, I didn't finish watching season one. I will eventually. I still have my Showtime account. I think I'm going to cancel Showtime on the 16th. So either I'll watch it before then or I don't know. So I've seen and read interviews about like, why did the L word come back? And it was because after all of this time, after the decade that this has been off the air, nothing has replaced the L word. I even saw interviews like back in, I don't know, 2009 or something, where Eileen Shaken said that she thought that by the time the show went off the air, there would already be a bunch of other lesbian shows, but there aren't. I really, really imagined that when this show went off the air after a good run, that there would be other shows, not just one, but several, that were taking up the mission of representing LGBT lives in popular entertainment. And it's just not the case. I guess the good news is that stories that are mainly about straight white people, such as say, sex education as a good example, they have more than one gay character and they're not just like the token minority. We don't just have that one person of color, that one token and gay person. I know that the original hour got a lot of criticism for being like really white even though it's set in LA and it didn't 
doesn't reflect the demographics of LA and one of the big differences between the old show and the new show is that this new show does a better job of representing the racial diversity within LA that already exists. Sure the old show did not do that but I still think that it was ahead of its time. I mean look at any show that was set in New York City that was set in the 90s or the 2000s. It was way wider than New York City actually was. I think that the demographics for New York City was like 44% of the population was white. You would not know that by watching Sex in the City or Friends, Will and Grace. Seinfeld was from like the 80s and 90s but again I think that white people were like about half of the population but even less than that if we're talking about non-Hispanic whites which all of those characters were I'm pretty sure. That's not just a difference between the old L word and the new L word. It's a difference between diversity then and now where I think that our shows now are a little bit more diverse and they do a better job of representing the diversity that already exists. So I mentioned in an earlier video that it just felt like when it came to TV shows, movies, etc. There was this very narrow diversity quota where you could only have like one or two gay characters. You could only have one or two token minority friends, even if it's set in a city where the minority is the majority. And so the L word was actually really progressive by having a discussion on what does it mean to be a double minority in the pilot episode by one of the main characters. I remember when I was in high school, there was also another show called X's and O's. It did not last very long. And then after that, uh, there's a show set in Glasgow which was called lip service and I remember I read an interview on After Ellen this was before After Ellen um had this issue going on it was not like this when I was in high school this is a more recent problem but anyway before that was a problem on After Ellen I read this interview on that website and the creator of lip service said that she really loved the L word and she didn't want to think of her show as being in competition with it but think of Seinfeld and Friends like nobody's gonna say why do you need a show like Friends when something like Seinfeld already exists and I think that that shows how much freedom you have when you write about like straight white people all the time where even though they're both sitcoms about straight white people who live in New York City in the same time period people were able to see those two shows as their own distinct shows whereas with lip service people would look at that and say oh, that's another version of the L word. Shouldn't two of those shows be able to coexist at the same time? So there is still that diversity quota in that there can only be one show like this. And it, it kind of makes me wonder if there was ever anybody else who had ideas like this and then maybe that got shot down with, but there's already the L word. Why do you need another show about a gay ensemble cast of women? So, uh, Quick confession time. I'm gonna be real with you, okay? <laughs> the L Word isn't like one of my favorite shows. In fact, I, I got really angry at The L Word. I stopped watching like maybe 12, 13 years ago. Hadn't watched it since until I was like, oh, The L Word's coming back for old time sakes. I'm gonna go on After Ellen, I'm gonna check. <laughs> because you know, I used to read the recaps on After Ellen and I hadn't realized that this was going down on that website. And <sighs> We, we don't have time to dissect what I read on After Ellen. I just, um, I noticed I have this issue where I do not know how to make a video that's under 20 minutes long and it's a problem for me, okay? It's a problem for me. I read this transphobic shit on After Ellen, how they feel so excluded or whatever from the L word, a show that's supposed to be for them because, you know, God forbid, Marja Lewis Ryan decided it would be a good idea to include trans people in the L word. Yeah, that is kind of what made me think, I'm definitely gonna watch this. But what made me stop watching 
It's a pattern of things. You might know this if you've watched some of my scum reviews. I don't like soap operas. I think that shows are better when they're understated. I think that sometimes less is more. I don't like it when we have a shitload of angst that gets in the way of relationship and character development and when character and relationship development is seen as secondary or completely unimportant because it gets in the way of a fucking food fight and the show should just be about the fucking food fight and not about seeing a character develop over time. So with the L word, I got really into the relationships, the relationships. I got really into the friendships. Seeing this group of lesbian and bisexual women be there for each other, be friends with each other, it was completely new to me. And that's something that is missing from a lot of TV because yes, we do have more lesbian and bisexual romances on TV and that's cool. And there needs to be more shows about the community and about friendship and love within the community. What were the reasons why I wasn't as much into the romantic relationships in the L word? One, the cheating was a problem. It's not like, oh my God, cheating so immoral. How could you do that? I hate it when characters are mean to each other. No. It's not that. It was so fucking repetitive. The only time I was okay with overloading the show with all of these cheating storylines and having just one after the other, it was this moment in season two when Jenny and Bet look at each other and they understand each other because Bet had judged Jenny so hard for cheating on Tim with Marina. And now like the tables have turned, she's like in Jenny's position and she sees herself in Jenny. And I thought that was such a beautiful moment. And I really liked the friendship between Jenny and Bet that formed after that. But let's start with Jenny. Marina, is your, is your reading group a gay group? No, there are straight people. You know, kid with the little apron on. I understand her cheating on Tim with Marina. I mean, if some woman like that hit on you, would you not cheat? Of course you would. But this relationship was super underdeveloped. I could see what the appeal was in the pilot episode. Like they both like books, they're both into literature, but they don't really develop that as the show goes on. That's the height of the development and everything else is built off of angst, it's built off of sex, and there's nothing deeper than that. It's a very shallow connection. And the way that they just wrote Marina off the show, ugh. And then again, this problem develops with Bet. There's some issue going on with Bet and Tina, and then this other woman comes along named Candace. What does Candace have that Tina doesn't have? We never get to fucking explore that. That relationship only existed as an obstacle to Bet and Tina. As soon as Tina finds out, Bet pretty much loses all interest in Candace. Yes, we do see her with Candace once again in season two, but that's the end of it. And we never really explore what deeper issues lied with their relationship that led to this cheating. I thought that Bet and Tina's relationship was at their most interesting in season two after they had broken up. And we see what the divorce process looks like when you were never legally married. I thought that was super interesting because it really shows how the right to get divorced is just as important as the right to get married. Whether or not you and Bet eventually reconcile, especially if you decide to get back together and rebuild trust in your relationship, first you need to have your autonomy. Bet and Tina getting back together in season three, I think, like, okay, what's gonna happen now? Tina has become a more independent woman? And is that gonna cause a relationship issue? Are we gonna find out that Bet never really loved Tina? She just really loved that Tina was a pushover, was easy to control. And now that Tina won't let herself be controlled in that way, how is that gonna affect the relationship? Could their relationship get stronger as a result? Because Tina will challenge Bet in a way that Bet really needs to be challenged. We don't explore that at all because as soon as season three starts, she's like cyber fucking daddy of two. All of a sudden she wants to sleep with men. 
I meant to talk about the Elwer Generation Q, and now I'm getting into my issues with Bet and Tina and with the original L Word. But it's like the point that I was trying to make was that I watched the show. I was interested in character development. I was interested in relationship development. As soon as one season stops and another season starts, we're going to make Helena a completely different person. We're going to make Alice a completely different person who's like, oh, what the fuck? And then you find some random reason to ruin Bet and Tina's relationship instead of just working with the problems that already existed within their relationship, you know? There are just a lot of problems that either came out of nowhere or on the contrary, we have problems that we spent a lot of time on. It would just get forgotten about or it wouldn't be dealt with properly. So that's kind of why I didn't like soap operas because there were so many continuity issues of suddenly characters would disappear, or plot lines would disappear or plot lines would come completely out of nowhere and they wouldn't have anything to do with who the character was or... What was my point? I don't want continuity issues within the next season with the original show. They'd have a season finale with like cliffhangers and all of this drama and you think that in the next season they're gonna like build off of that and then the next season would start and they would just like take a storyline that you thought had potential that you thought they were gonna spend a lot of time on and really develop and just like eh let's just quickly throw that shit in the trash. Hmm? So I hope that they don't do that this time around. Back in about 2007 or so, I came to the conclusion that I don't like soap operas. Not just from watching The L Word, but also like queer as folk had gotten on my nerves. Watch The L Word, that was getting on my nerves. I got really into Skins and then that got the fuck on my nerves. But the thing about Skins at least is it was very revolutionary for a teen show. It did a lot of things that I could not find in other teen shows. So even though I didn't like all of the melodrama, I still watched it and had a love-hate relationship with it, just like I had a love-hate relationship with The L Word because I couldn't find some of the things that were in The L Word that I liked. I couldn't find those in other TV shows. But since time has gone on, when it comes to Skins, I can find other TV shows that have some of the things that I liked in Skins without all of the melodrama. So that's why I was such a big fan of Scum. When I discovered Scum, I was like, hey, when I was a teenager and I was watching Skins and I was really frustrated, this is a show that I much would have preferred at that time. This is what I was looking for at that point in time. I think also Sex Education. There's a lot of teen shows out there, so there aren't a lot of lesbian dramas out there. And I would love it if after all of this, somebody said, hey, what if we made another lesbian show? But instead of having it be Drama City, we can just have it be more understated. Again, it might not be everyone's cup of tea. If you like soap operas, that's completely fine. It's a taste issue, but yeah. I lost the point that I was trying to make. I very much want the L Word Generation Q to be successful because I want the success of the L Word Generation Q to bring about more opportunities for other stories that might be more to my liking.